Okay. Uh, so I just want to take a moment and sort of introduce and, and welcome everyone today. My name is Jessica Lang and I'm the chair for the Open Repositories Working Group, the Community Building and Engagement Task Group. Um, we're pleased today to offer the first of two calls related to repository workflows. Um, a reminder that we do have a second call on February 7th at 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, the second event will be a community call, so it's a bit more informal in nature. At uh, that one, we will have three presenters from three different Canadian universities talking about their workflows. Um, in sort of a lightning talk style. And then after that, we'll open that call up to uh, more of a general discussion and conversation. So if you're interested, please feel free to also register for that um, on Carl's website. Today, we are joined by Joe MacArthur from OA Works. Uh, the way we'll run today's webinar is that we'll start with a screening of a presentation given on the tool share paper from the 2021 Southern Miss International Repository Conference. Uh, this talk was given by Leila Sternum from Montana State and Joe MacArthur from OA Works. Uh, the presentation is about 30 minutes long, after which we will go to a live Q&A with Joe. Um, Joe is the director and co-founder of OA Works, a library-owned nonprofit known for tools such as the OA Button, button and Instant ILL. Um, since it's a webinar setting, you can pose your questions into the Q&A, um, but please feel free to chat if you want to um, ask questions. Uh, Mike Nason, Jordan Hale, and myself are all co-moderators, so feel free to direct um, if you do want to put it into the Q&A, you can direct specific questions uh, to us. Uh, and with that, I believe we will go to the recording and then go to the live Q&A afterwards. Um, so we had a little change the schedule after it got uh, published because no one wants to hear from me. Uh, uh, so um, I'm going to uh, yield most of my time to our, our partner, uh, Montana Leila, to do most of the talking. I'm going to be here for Q&A after and bits of discussion um, and to uh, fill in the, the gaps and the depths of our code bases and things like that. Um, but mostly you have an upgrade for the session. Um, uh, I'm happy to tell you all. Um, and uh, yeah, Leila, over to you. So I agreed to do this uh, to, to present today uh, on as long as Joe promised to correct me when I got things wrong um, in the nicest way that I can say that. So um, if you hear Joe jump in, it's just because um, you know, I don't know all the facts and that's fine. That's why it's good to have good partners. That's what I like to think. So um, yeah, we're here uh, to talk about Share Your Paper for Libraries. Um, I'm the Scholarly Communication Librarian at Montana State University. Um, and I've had the privilege over the past two years of working with Joe, um, who was until earlier this week of open access button. And he hasn't changed. Um, but over the last eight years since the open access button got started, um, they used to make the open access button, so it made sense to be called that. Um, but since then, they also now um, have produced instant ILL and share paper, which is why we're here today. And so um, as of this week, uh, the open access button is now OA works, um, which is exciting and um, it's a great rebrand, we can get into that if people are interested. Um, one part that I think is neat is that the website is now oa.works, which is Indeed. easy to remember, and I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I encourage you to check that out. Um, and uh, on your way, um, maybe you can check out, share your paper. So uh, about two years ago, well, step back one step further, some of you may have been here three years ago in 2018, when we lost sound, Mike. Literally nothing changed. I don't know what happened. <laughs> gonna, I'll try I to share again. Dog bark. Well, that wasn't me. <laughs> Let's try this again.
Uh, just throw a yes in the chat if it if it's working. I talked about uh, green open access and how it's so good and it's what I have committed my career to, and also it's so dot w o r k s, which is Indeed. easy to remember, and I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, so uh, I encourage you to check that out. Um, and uh, on your way, um, maybe you can check out, show your paper. So uh, about two years ago, well, step back one step further. Some of you may have been here three years ago in 2018 when um, I talked about uh, green open access and how it's so good and it's what I, have committed my career to and also it's so frustrating that sometimes I can't imagine that it's something we do voluntarily um and so Joe and I got to talking and thought there has to be an easier way um there has to be a way that it's not like pulling teeth to get manuscripts from authors to put them in the repository um to you know to figure out publishers policies and to and to put it all together into a good looking repository record um and so what we envisioned and then what we came up with was share your paper. And that's what's running on the screen. Um, it's just a really simple walkthrough of, of the tool. So basically, um, you pop in a DOI, uh, the system will tell an author what version they need. They drag it into the, the box there, press upload, and they've done a repository deposit. Um, you know, then I do a little bit on the back end, but that's basically it. Um, so we set out to make a thing and we made it and i think that is a um it is often a success in itself and um, but we're hoping that that you'll also uh, be able to use this and, and be successful with it so um a little bit more about our motivation um three metrics that that seem to be important to many repositories um are uh, things in the repository right you have to have something there for it to feel like a success for your administrators or you know deans or AULs to to appreciate what you're doing, so you need stuff in there. Um, to get this stuff in there, we can't spend a ton of money, right? So the cost per deposit should be pretty low, and then the stuff that's in there, right? We want it to be high quality articles that don't violate copyright. We want it to be um, well described with the metadata that we're interested in, and that accurately describes items so that they can be found. Um, through search engines. Um, so when I was hired in 2013 at MSU, um, the understanding of the of repositories at that point was like, I don't know, you just set one up and then you do a bunch of workshops, you get people, um, you get people excited, you teach them how to do it, you teach them, you know, the all the benefits of open access, and then they'll just the the submissions will just start flowing into your repository. Um, right, so that was the self deposit process. Well, it turns out, at least in my repository, and I imagine in many others, certainly many that I've uh, other repository managers who I've spoken to, we just never got those those deposits never came rolling in. Um, I probably I was trying to add up the math this morning. I probably had like 10 repeat self archivers. And that that feels like a lot. Um, so you know, it's not. It certainly hasn't filled my repository. So very low deposit rate of self archiving. The cost is easy to justify. Right? We spend you know the money on outreach, you know the time on outreach, but we're not we're not doing much except having the repository. So the cost per deposit is quite low. But again, the deposit is low. Um, and then the quality of the deposits, right? So that, what, is it the right copy? Is an embargo honored? Is the metadata describe it uh, properly? Varies really depending on the uploader. And so it could be great and it could be terrible. You know, there's there's a few minimum requirements to deposit in my repository and some uploaders just put in, you know, which is like title and date. And then they're there. So um, that wasn't, we weren't hitting all the marks with that. So what many of us moved to was mediated deposit. And so that, uh, right, in in my uh, library, what that means is that we reach out to authors and ask them for current articles. Lots of people, um, you know, do CV 
um, checking and they'll go through, you know, everything on someone's CV and, and deposit it and then have, you know, a long conversation to get all those, the right copies. Um, but what that means is that we spend a lot of time gathering articles and we, we're pretty good at that. Um, you know, repository managers, we tend to be a pretty persuasive bunch. Uh, it is high cost though, right? All that attention to, to authors and to answering their questions and to you know begging them for their stuff right i have definitely gone to um uh, faculty members offices with a usb drive in my hand and knocked on their door and said hello i'm here for the paper <laughs> right and that you if we did that all day long for everyone you know there'd be no time to sleep at night so it's high cost it's high touch um but the quality is good right so right if i'm the one describing it then it's going to be up to my standards so uh there there are definitely trade-offs um the goal with sherry paper was to get the best of both worlds and so um in the past year that i've been using sherry paper in my repository i've maintained that high deposit rate we um just before we started using sherry paper i had a 43 percent deposit rate which i'll talk more about i'm pretty proud of that uh and it's gone up since then. Um, it is very low cost per deposit. So it's, you know, nothing is zero cost because it takes some amount of time and we have to host the stuff and the website and the repository, but it is a much lower cost than, than we had been putting in. Um, and then the quality of the deposits is high because again, uh, right, I'm doing a, just a little bit of overseeing, but we're also, we're getting all this good metadata and permissions from share your paper. Uh, so, um, you know, that's sort of the, the, a little bit of the nuts and bolts of it. From a, a values point of view, um, I care about green open access. I care about repositories being full of current science and research because um, we can't, live in a world where we just depend on APCs to make things open because there's just not enough money there's not enough funding uh, to go around and we won't change the way that the system works if we just keep paying publishers um, more and more money um, and we'll run out eventually uh, I usually right I have an APC fund that runs out like in August every year when it starts in July like it's just not sustainable um, and then um, all that will will lead to greater bibliodiversity. And if you're not familiar with that term, it's the idea that um, the variety of publications and publication venues available um, within a, a given uh, environment, so that could be, you know, academic publishing, um, the more the more opportunities there are, the more the greater diversity of opportunity, the better everything does. Um, you know, if you think about it's the it borrows from the uh, ecology um biodiversity right the more species they are the healthier an ecosystem is the more journals there are the more kinds of journals and publishers there are the healthier scholarly publishing will be um and that is something that we have to be invested in um for the future of of knowledge not just of libraries right so um you know overall we're we're working toward more open access but not at a not at a huge cost, like something like transformative agreements or APCs will give us. Um, so uh, that all sounds great, right? And and the way it works sort of feels like magic when you use it. But behind there, there it's not just magic. Um, uh, we borrowed a lot of the tools that the open access button had been using, and then improved a lot of them, and then rebuilt them like four times to get it all. Um, working really, really well, so you won't even notice uh, in the background. But what's happening is um, you pop in a DOI and um, and we go out and check a database of journal permissions. Um, and so it's looking at embargo periods, there's a set statement, um, what version, I guess most importantly, what version of the article is allowed to be shared um, and where. And so, and all that gets gets returned to the author very, very quickly. Um, and so then we lay that out. Uh, we try to lay out very clearly um, and give authors just enough information so they know what they're, they have to do without trying to describe all this. Because um, I know that I can talk about copyright, you know, clearly for 
as long as I'm given. And most people who aren't in that all the time, their eyes kind of glaze over if you get too deep in the weeds. So the information's there if people are interested, but we don't uh, put it right out front. Um, and then, right, we need the we need the item to deposit. And so there's, uh, I'll show you in a minute, there's a an upload tool and we do instant version checking. And so uh, authors upload, hopefully their preprint, and then we run over a hundred little checks on it just to make sure it's the right paper. Um, and then it's the right version. So we can tell very, very confidently whether it's a postprint or a publisher's version. So we're not um, you know, blindly allowing authors to, to upload the wrong version. And if they get the wrong version, well, gently convince them to try again and if that's just not happening um we'll sort of give them a little escape shoot pop them out and then uh, a librarian can come in and try to solve problems right because we all know there's some squeaky wheels out there and um you know there's an exception to everything so uh if they're not in a you know just lost in a system there's still librarians behind it um once all that's done we get the right version um lots of metadata is collected um, and then is returned either in an email or a spreadsheet. So you can either do one at a time deposits or bulk uploading um, and don't have to you know, run around looking for the ISSN of a journal. And then um, the last step on this slide is that it's we we've been working on it with real libraries. So a lot of this was based on my workflow. Um, but not just my workflow. So while we've been developing this, um, we've talked to lots of other libraries, to copyright experts, to, to journals, to all sorts of people, um, lots to authors, right? Did a lot of user testing with real live authors. Um, lots of them were engineers uh, and they're not forgiving. And, um, and so we've tried to design a tool that is that really works and could work in any system. Um, have we got it perfectly? maybe not but there's still room to continue to to amend and evolve and to to make this a tool that really works for for any library um is that's the goal and i think we're pretty close hopefully um you all will give it a try and and uh and see and let us know if it's if it is or if it's not um so how does it work in uh my library um i guess uh, I used to spend, I used to have a student and an automated database thingy gather all this information um, and sort of get a full metadata record for an article so that um, I knew it fit my scope and it um, was current and we'd have all the metadata. We could, we had the ISSN, so we could do the, um, you know, look in Sherpa Romeo and do get all this information. And then um, I would pull that down and then do copyright clearance for each individual article and send out individual emails to authors asking them for their paper. Um, and that whole process for around 100 articles would take um, generally two and a half days, you know, and that's leaving some room for emails and meetings and lunch. But it, it took a number of days to do all that. Um, now, I only have to gather five pieces of metadata to, to work this system. So I need the author's name, um, I need their email, I need the article title, the journal title, and a DOI. Um, and I pop that into a spreadsheet or a student pops that into a spreadsheet. So that's pretty easily identified information. Um, and then it, it populates um, this email um, or a, a very similar version of this email. And um, you can see in the middle of the screen, there's a link with a fake DOI. When that's a real DOI, that uh, auto populates information so i don't need to find all that additional metadata um, an author will click that link and it pops them it does and when they click that link right it hits that permission system and they get back this screen um, that is customized to their to that article and the particulars around that um, so that just saved lots of time just in that um, and then we lay out you know what a post print is how they can tell where they can find it um what it should look like trying to make it as clear as possible um and this is um really helpful for first-time authors and once you get your authors trained right and maybe your authors are already well trained this is just a good reminder of of what they can and can't do 
Um, and then um, there near the bottom, you see there, there's a box and that's where they, you can drag your article in um, and click upload. And that is the, that's the deposit process. Um, so then they'll get a, um, a congratulations because they just did a great thing. And at the same time, the, the article is instantly available in Zenodo. So, um, you know, if, if it's three o'clock in the morning and they have a great application due the next day and they need an open access copy and they forgot to do it until right now, um, right? I don't have to be up at 3.30 in the morning trying to make things happen. They have a, an, a copy with a DOI that's open access immediately. Um, and that is, is, could be important in that one instance. And in the rest of the instances, it's just immediately gratifying. Um, and then we'll get the, the email with the metadata and um, grab that and pull the item down from Zenodo and then pop it into the repository. Um, and it uh, and that's it. That's a deposit. I've had a lot of authors who, um, you know, they're high publishing and I talk to them a lot, but they've never really been eager about green open access. Um, the first time they used share your paper. Um, you can see at the bottom there's a do another button. It was so easy and so painless that they just like kept, they were like, oh, I have like two more papers that I haven't deposited into the repository yet. And they just, so I asked for one and they gave me three. And it just, right, like I, that has, sometimes in the past people have said, oh, that was nice. Um, here's my CV. Could you, you know, I've been a researcher for 15 years. Could you just look through this and get back to me? And that's not really a um that process is sort of long and drawn out and, and not instantly gratifying and with this it was just um you know they just did it and then all of a sudden their most three recent three most recent papers were in the repository so um uh it's if nothing else great pr and and a really good way to get get current research in um so uh when they click do another here. Um, this is uh, what Share Your Paper looks like on my library's website. It is, um, it is, it fits in with our branding. Um, it uses, and I'll show you how this works in a minute. Um, it, ScholarWorks is the name of my repository, like many repositories, but you know, it could easily say Aquila there. Um, and they put their DOI in there, click next, and then it does that permissions check again. Um, and so they could keep doing that for ever, really, um, as, as many papers as they have, I guess. Um, and it, it fits in on my library website. So it's, um, you know, I'm not asking authors to go to some third party site that, you know, they don't know if it's spam or not, right? We're, so we're leaning on the, the trust in the library to make this work. Um, if something, you know, if, if someone uh, gives us the wrong version or the wrong paper or, whatever it is, um, we keep the messaging, try to keep it gentle. Um, and then um, and then there's, again, an escape hatch. So if someone's like, no, I promise this is the right version, um, they can give it to us and then we'll get in contact and either say, oh, you're right. Um, or thank you so much for this copy that you downloaded from my library database that I also pay for. Um, the copy that we're really looking for is this other copy. Um, you know. Which, which will continue to happen, but less and less is the hope. Um, so uh, <sighs> that's a lot, but it's the goal is to make it pretty lightweight. So um, uh, it'll work with any repository. Uh, again, in a minute, I'll show you the setup screen. Um, so you can put in your repository name and your, you know, your information. So it, it feels like it's a part of your workflow. Um, and, and then there's some uh, other customizations, like, do you want to, um, you know, do uh, make things available in dark deposit or um, uh, things that are already open access? Do you want another copy in your repository? So um, you can make choices like that. And then um, you get a snippet of code and you pop it into your website. And the hardest part, it seems, is figuring out where the best place for that is. And so I have it on a page in the in my library. We have a CMS, so you know we just popped up a page, and and there it is. Um, you know, it might fit in the libguide. There might be a page in your 
repository that is a good page for submissions, um, or maybe some other page. Um, so there, uh, once you've figured that out, you just pop a snippet of code in, and there it is running. Um, you don't need to update it, uh, you know, or you know, it, it will get updated on its own. You know, I don't do any of that. Uh, so um, it makes it very accessible, even if you don't have development time. Um, this is that setup screen. Uh, sorry, I didn't move forward to show you that. Um, it's a lot of reading. Um, you can check this out um, at shareyourpaper.org slash libraries. Uh, and, um, but basically on the right, in that blue gray area, it's showing you, walking you through all the steps. And on the left, um, as you make choices, they'll show up there so you can see what you're getting and what authors will see. So, um, you know, if you if something looks wrong, you can change it. Um, if next week you decide that you want your repository name to change, you can go back in and update that. Um, so it's it's very easy to set up um, and doesn't you don't need a whole lot of uh, deep knowledge of really anything except your repository. Um, so. Uh, Right now, uh, items, uh, and I talked about this a little bit already, but um, when people deposit, they um, things go to Zenodo, and then they, um, then I pull them down and get it into the repository. Eventually, um, the goal is for direct deposit, but that's there's a lot more uh, individual repository integration to get there. Um, and so, for right now, this saves a ton of time, and then. Um, you know, if you're already bulk uploading, this just like sets you up really well for a bulk upload. Or if you're individually uploading, um, and, you know, as those emails come in, you just, it can be just, you know, a part of your day, you just upload in the repository and there you go. Um, so uh, I, I had made a workflow diagram and then I decided that I just tell you about it instead because uh, it was pretty complicated. And um, so, uh, right, in our old process, I think um, I think we touched the metadata three, three people touched it three times, right? So I had a student gather it, and then I checked it over, and then I handed it to a repository assistant who um, did the copyright clearance, and then uh, either gave it back to a student or gave it to me to do the actual deposit. So, um, you know, and in, in that process, right, when we first gather something, it probably doesn't have page, you know, has dummy page numbers from the first online version, and doesn't have a volume number yet, and, um, and then, right, things get their copying errors, we just like, it was too much. Um, and so, uh, with Share Your Paper, um, we just collect those five pieces of metadata to start, send us the email, um, sometimes a follow-up email, People are busy. Um, get the get the paper. Um, look at the metadata and then deposit. So it's um, um like I said a much faster process. Um, and I will say my um, we've I said we had a forty three percent deposit rate, um, right? So of all the requests we sent out, forty three of them came back and we had a paper in hand, um, which took six or seven years to develop, and I was really proud of. And Still, I'm pretty proud of it. Um, about a year ago, we switched to using Share Your Paper. Um, and at first, that rate stayed pretty consistent, which I was impressed with because about a year ago, we were also, you know, like right in the thick of online only education at the beginning of the pandemic. So um, that people were willing to use a new system at that point uh, to me meant that the system must not be very hard because. Uh, people really didn't have much bandwidth to do extra. Um, and then over the past year, uh, our, we've seen that deposit rate just creep up. We haven't made huge leaps and bounds, um, but we are, it is creeping up and we're definitely getting things faster and it takes us, you know, less than a quarter of the time to, to get the materials and deposit them. So um, that feels like a real win, especially in um, in a year when we haven't been able to um, hire new people for development or or processing and student work has been um, spot, you know, my students are out quarantining every other week, it feels like. Um, and so 
uh, you know, there's, it's, it's just been a hard year to get things done and still we've gotten things done. So um, that feels like a real win to me. So um, before it took a, like it worked, but it took a lot of time. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd worked hard on outreach and developing relationships and, and education um, and all that continues. Um, but I didn't want to spend that much time doing the actual deposit anymore. Um, and so now uh, we're doing well. We're more efficient. We're, we're still getting high quality deposits into our repository and we're spending a whole lot less time doing it. Um, uh, recently, my dean, the dean of the library, um, who was one of those 10 self archivers, um, he was very, every time he published, he's just the most faithful, which, you know, I, I'm very grateful for. Um, he, uh, he um, used the shared paper process for the first time uh, recently, and he sent me an email and I'll read it to you. It said, wow. I just did the shared paper process, and I must say that it is a vast improvement to the old process. I think it took me all of three minutes. Thank you. So that's the kind of email that I'd be happy to get from my boss any day. Um, and we have this paper, and it's in the repository, so it's a, it's for sure a win. Um, so if you want to check it out, uh, here is uh, a URL, and we'll pop that in the chat as well. Um, so you don't have to write things down um, and you can sign up to get updates when things change when you know we get sweet new features you can be the first to know um and uh and i hope that that when when things change when you try this tool out um, and it works or it doesn't work um please share um part of the The best part, I think, of working with Open Access Button, now OA Works, um, is that they're not just building things in a vacuum and and then you know handing them to libraries and saying, like, we know what you want, here it is, it should work. Um, right there, uh, instead, there's a, a huge investment in working with libraries, with librarians, um, and and understanding our processes and our right where we have successes and where we struggle and then building tools that help us do better and make the world more open um and these are some of the some of the uh, institutions and people that that oa works has has worked with um and i'm you know i feel very fortunate to be um part of that list and um and that's only the beginning right that that to work for the community the community gets to work um with tools like this as well so um you know uh everything can't happen you know like magic but if there are things that you think like oh you know if it only did this one extra piece you know then it would save a hundred hours in my year like don't be shy um you know i think that's it's uh two years ago sherry paper felt like a dream and now it's here so um you know it's it's good to dream um and and i just want to uh say that it's um as part of the rebrand um away works has really put their values at the front of what they do um and i think that that's that's it feels in line with how libraries work um and it feels uh very honest uh, from my experience working with with Joe, and so right, I just the 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 term um, open access tools for a just and kind information age um, feels like feels like the world that I'd like to live in. Uh, and that is the formal part. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we can answer questions and talk more. All right. All right, everyone. So that was sort of the, the recorded part. It segues nicely to our live Q&A. Um, so the way we'll do it is there is the Q&A like feature along your toolbar. So you can type your questions into the Q&A and then uh, Joe will be able to kind of see them in order. Um, 
Yeah. And as I said, if you, if you, you know, maybe you're shy, you can feel free to message me, Mike or Jordan, and we can, we can pop a question in on your behalf into the Q and A. And uh, please start asking questions. <laughs> Anyone. <laughs> in the lull, I would just say, you know, thank you to Layla who who isn't here, but I enjoy I enjoyed listening to her talk the first time, and it's uh, you know like a like a fine wine, it's aged beautifully. Um, so uh, she isn't here at the moment, but a uh, thank you to her. Well, I guess when people maybe are typing, I'll ask a question. Um, uh, Layla uh, alluded to like a direct deposit, and I guess I was curious about where that is, you know, because this presentation happened a couple months or six months ago, maybe. So, we had any updates in that regard? Yeah. Um, so the the at the high level, in terms of what you've heard, no, not really. Um, a lot of the um, you know the challenges of running a tool like Shayo Paper, which tries to take a lot off of the plate of uh, of the community, is keeping the the tight integrations the high quality of data just at that level um and and maintaining that over time so we spend a lot of time just keeping up with permissions changes keeping the systems um running and, and making sure that they're all working really well um and um for uh the past six months a lot of our development time has been spent um with the Gates Foundation working on a new tool, which actually sort of segues really nicely into I think what Shayo Paper is doing, which isn't a mistake. Um, but you know, Layla hadn't talked about it a lot. It's sort of that piece of, you know, if putting together a, a, an outreach process and saying, finding out all the articles that are, are being published at, at, at Montana, finding those key bits of information that allow you to make a request and then getting that out. And actually, I, I did not plan this, but it just it just so happens that that's you know a lot of what we've been doing for the past six months is um, doing that with the uh, in partnership with the Gates Foundation. Um, but again, you know, like we worked with Layla, thinking about how we build that out as a general tool that lots of people can use. Um, and so that's a workflow that has been top of our mind, and for at least the Gates Foundation, but this won't be the same for for everyone. Um, Show your paper has been at the center of making that um, making that easy. Um, and, you know, we spent a lot of time sort of thinking about it in similar ways. How can we really sort of make this make this easy for everyone involved? Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's... Well, that's great because we're starting to get some... Can you see the questions in the q and I, I Oh, I'm looking in the chat, but... Ah, yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, uh, I'll ask the ones in chat that I, that I saw first because um, I already have thought about those a little bit. Um, so uh, Mike's question in the chat was, have we had any hesitation from faculty about the um, Zenodo piece? The answer there is that we don't hear hesitation from faculty on the Zenodo piece. The main place where we hear um, hesitation on that piece is from librarians who rightly want to know, you know, is, is Zenodo up to scratch and how can I make Zenodo be my repository? Uh, and I think, so that's really the main place where we hear um, concerns about Zenodo. Um, we chose Zenodo as our sort of default uh, deposit place very closely. Um, Zenodo has a long-term commitment from CERN to keep running. It's got good policies um, and strong APIs um, to get things in and out of um, and to, you know, be a good bedrock for, um, uh, uh, preserving things for a long time, making them discoverable and getting information in and out. Um, they're also built on open source code. The team there, um, I think is, um, uh, actually, I'm pretty sure it's it's operated as a nonprofit, but within, I think within CERN, it's not its own standalone. Don't quote me there, but it, but it meets all of the similar values that we wanted to. We're not sort of sticking it into a place that we don't believe is, is, is a good home for, for content if that's where it stays, um, even though we try and make it um, incredibly easy to, to get stuff out and, and into IRs. Um, uh, going to the next question um, from, from Dana. Um, the question is, is an, I'm going to read them out just for the sake of the recording and, and things like that. Um, so Dana asks, as a not very technical person, am I correctly, am I understanding correctly that the process is submission through Share Your Paper to Zenodo and then download to a local repository such as DSpace uh, from there. Um, 
Yes, you are understanding one of the ways the process can work. So um, a lot of uh, uh, um, the sort of two different paths that a deposit can go. Um, and really it depends on um, essentially if you're able to support the tool, if you're able to financially support the tool or not. So by default for everyone for free, um, for as long as we're around, um, you'll be able to deposit through Share Your Paper into Zenodo for free. We then build several di different mechanisms and Layla spoke about those to get that content from Zenodo to your IR. We, wanna, we really want content to get into your IR. Um, and so um, uh, without doing a tight integration necessarily with you, which takes time and money for us. So content will go into Zenodo instantly and then you will be able to get it out in a, in a, in a number of ways. We can email you the metadata and the file. And as Layla said, um, you can then upload that in, inside your normal manual deposit processes. If you want to do extra checks or anything else at that point, you can do that sort of stuff. The same for um, a bulk deposit. So we'll give you all of the metadata um, and, and, and links to the files inside a spreadsheet. that You can then upload into whatever platform you happen to be using. Um, and then there are things, those are good for smaller scale repositories or, or if you're just getting started and testing out the service. Um, and then there are um, OAI PMH feeds, which some repositories will allow you to just ingest from automatically. Um, and then there are um, custom JSON APIs, REST APIs that we provide. That's good if you want. There are some things that the OAI PMH feeds don't provide from us that you can get from us in that JSON API. All of these things are free to use. Um, your repository probably has tools built in to use them already, except the custom JSON API piece. That's 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 where it does get into, into custom. But in all of those methods, things go into Zenodo first, they're, they're stored safely, they're discoverable, and then you can put them into the repository at your leisure. Um, and the benefit to that is we can provide it for free, authors get instant gratification, and the content's looked after. Um, and of course, it also provides options for people who don't have a repository, which is you know, most institutions in, in, you know, in the world. Um, the paid for option is where we don't put things into Zenodo, we put them directly into your institutional repository in a way that it suits you. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that, um, uh, depending on uh, your, your repository setup, um, your preferences, um, and things like that. I won't go too deeply into it, but just to say there are two forks in that process but you're, you're completely right, Dana, that's, that's one way that it works and the way that Layla mainly spoke about, but the, that um, pay for route is, is directly into your, your IR, which is what we want anyway, which is why we built all the other integration routes, um, but that just costs us time and money to, to support uh, over time. So that's the place where um, we ask folks to um, pay for what is otherwise a, a free tool. Um, some questions are similar. Okay, Tara's question about metadata sort of address, worth acknowledging. Okay, I'm gonna to move to the other questions now. Um, right, open questions. Um, Elizabeth Yates asks, thanks so much for this, just clarifying a couple of things. One, is this tool available for other libraries now? Yes. Um, two, how does content get from ScholarWorks into Web of Science? Um, so, uh, I in some ways can't speak specifically for ScholarWorks because it's not a repository I run, um, but I, I'll speak generally for um, most repositories. Um, and I think that applies to ScholarWorks too. So the way that um, that works uh, is that those repositories are harvested by Unpayable, and in fact, sort of many aggregators, but, but the primary one is, is from Unpayable, which picks up stuff in your repository link and links it to the published version. And Web of Science and lots of other tools. Um, in fact, many, most of the places where I expect your, your scholars are discovering content um, have an integration with Unpayable where that version will then appear somewhere in the UI. We don't control that or anything like that, but that's how that works. We, are, we say that to um, scholars because that's what they want to hear, but it's actually not a part that we directly build. We are leaning explicitly on other open source, nonprofit infrastructure um, that the community has built to do that. Um, and we're just, we're just making sure that that linkage gets made. Um, and so for instance, we know that Zenodo is really well harvested by Unpayable and gets um, 
its content gets made discoverable through there and through all of the places that Zenodo, you know, tries to make their own relationships and things like that. But that's that's the main way that we um, we, we uh, sort of ensure that. Um, uh, Maria, um, take a pause. Uh, so, um, so Maria asks, different publishers have, I like the sort of quick buy question uh, uh, stuff, it's, it's great. Different, different publishers have different laundry lists of requirements for putting a post print into a repository, adding a specific statement, a CC license. How is this accomplished with the deposit process? Great question. And it gives me a chance to talk about my favorite thing, um, which is our, our permission system. So, um, uh, but okay, okay. Um, sorry. So Layla spoke a little bit about um, sort of some of what our permission system does. We are checking against publisher policies um, in order to make sure that the deposit that goes in is, is meets all those conditions. But there's lots of layers to that, and this is where in the QA last time I jumped in as well. So we built a. Uh, uh, a whole new permission system to be able to power share your paper. Um, we do not rely on share your paper, um, on Sherpa Romeo uh, in order to do that permissions check. So um, in putting share your paper together, one of the main challenges was building a completely open from the ground up um, uh, uh, permissions database um, that answered all of the points about permissions um, that you need to know everything from um, you know what the license on the final um, on the on the deposit should be, what the asset statement should be, um, collecting all of that and monitoring that over time as well, and preserving those policies over time. So we call this our permission system. You can find out a bunch of information about it at showyourpaper.org/permissions. But I will just say a few more things about it. So. That permission system was built to enable automatic permissions checking. That would mean that you could put, do a workflow this automated without worrying. It achieves that by first off, collecting all the data that you need to do the deposit in the first place, right? So, um, and, and organizing that in a machine readable way. So very simply what that means is for instance, um, there's no ambiguity in the system about whether a deposit, a, a deposit statement or a license applies to you know, a preprint in the repository or a postprint or a version of record. We split all these things out. And then we'll do things like, for instance, with the deposit statement, we won't copy the deposit statement from the, the publisher website directly. What we do is we, we copy what they say and we put in like merge tags and things like that. So, you know, a, a um, you know, a deposit statement that needs a citation uh, piece of information in there. Um, we, our system knows how to complete that statement with the information that it needs from, from the article in question. Um, so we include all sorts of, of, of things that, um, at least historically, I haven't checked recently, but Sherpa Romeo doesn't include and definitely doesn't include within the record. They might link out to the statement or the license or something like that, but all of that is inside of a record for us. Um, once we've done that, we're not just looking at journal policies or, or even just publisher policies. We're looking at all the policies um, and all the, the rights and licenses that might affect a work. Um, so at the moment, we'll look at article level licensing. Is this an open access article? Does it have a CC by license on it? If so, you know, to hell with what the publisher says, you know, the license is on there, we can use that to do the deposit. Um, you know, if you have a, um, uh, a right to attention, uh, policy on campus, um, then that's a right that we can use in order to streamline the deposit process, to enable deposit, but certainly to change the rules of, 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 of what needs to go in that, in, that, um, in that deposit. And so we have a database of, of, of um, lots of, uh, well, basically all of the um, rights retention policies um, that can affect a work. And we are able to sort of bring linkages in um, through the deposit process to, to get these rights correctly. So, um, and what, what is on our to-do list at the moment is to do the same for the funding of the work as well. And that's one thing where our relationship with the Gates Foundation is um, you know, gonna pay dividends for the community at large in, in the future. Um, so the permission system has all the information that you need in it. Um, the next part is it's, it's all open. The next part is that we monitor it constantly. So um, it's, 
to make all this data, we actually um, forked an initial database that Sarah Weppermann, who was also on the call, started, which was which was open and gave us a great starting point. Um, and then we've built on top of that over the years. And at every step as we've um, put policies in, what we set up is a monitoring system, which goes to those pages basically every hour in some cases and checks if they've changed. So we monitor like five different pages for else of it, their FAQs, the, the, um, the embargo lists, um, the policies itself. And we will check basically every hour to see if those change. If they do, then we can then update the policies accordingly. Um, so there's lots of other things about the system. I'm happy to answer more questions about it, but that's some of what we're doing in order to uh, make sure that as the deposit moves through the process, we're providing information um, or, or we're getting those permissions right. We hide the vast majority of this from the end user because we don't think they really care about it. But all in the background is this: this is this is happening. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Thanks, Joe. I'm just right. going to jump in quickly. So I see Joanne has asked sort of two questions. I feel like hmm. um, answered the first half of it about why is the nodo. So I think it's just the second part of how does one retrieve the metadata um, for bulk upload into the IR. And just to well, know, we have about five minutes left. So I've got a couple more questions, so do your best. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm we're gonna, we're gonna do a quick fire round. Um, how does one retrieve metadata for bulk upload into the IR? Um, we have um, a showyourpaper.org for slash setup. There's a portal where you'll be able to manage your, your thing and you can download it from there. Um, Maria Stewart, I'm curious about the hundreds of oral checks that are done automatically on the submitted PDF to know what the version is. Yeah. Um, that's our version checking system. We'll check for things like what's the file type. If it's a docx, then you're in good, you're in, you're, you're in, in, in a good position. We can sort of let that through. Technically speaking, we do also check that um, it's the file that we expect, right? So it's the same, it's the file for the paper being deposited. Um, and we do check that it looks like a paper that's an appropriate length. The other hundreds of little checks are things like, you know, checking to see if in the author setting manuscript is a, uh, things like, is there a deposit statement in there? If there's a deposit statement in there, then that can give us a, an example of um, an idea for, for um, what version it is. If it has a DOI on it, um, that gives us an idea for what the version might be. If it has, and these are some of the, the things you find when you tour through hundreds of, of AAMs, does it have a phone number in it? That's often an interesting indication. It's certainly not a version of record. Um, does it have you know, copyright else of it in it. If, if, if it has it in there and it's a PDF, then it's a, it's a final published PDF. We have sort of cataloged lots of different little signals like this that not just one way or another as to what version it might be. And there are hundreds of them. Uh, and so um, having done all of that and checked it against lots of different versions um, that we've been given over the years, that's what we mean by hundreds of little checks. Um, and when the system isn't sure, it knows it isn't sure and it passes it off to a person to double check. Um, uh, Maria asks, since the deposit will eventually get into the IR, is there a point at which the submitted author can accept the IR's distribution license while using the tool? Yes. In the setup portal, you can configure that. Uh, do we know if Zenodo supports sword deposits into the IR? I don't know, but we are happy to if that's what you need as a part of the paid integration. I don't think Zenodo would do a sword deposit into yours. Permission state to base sounds amazing. Uh, sorry, I should say, Janessa says, what is the coverage like for non-oligopoly non -olig and multilingual journals? Great question. Um, we uh, started with the biggest publishers and we moved down until we got to like 90, 90 something percent of articles. I did this work a long time ago, forgive me. Um, which means that our coverage of those is not as good as it could be. We had previously, I think, been in conversations with Carl about making sure that Canadian journals were included, but I think that hit a roadblock somewhere along the way. Um, if journals are missing, um, uh, they're, they're very easy for us to add, and we have an update um, uh, thing on the website where you can request us to update, and we'll, we'll normally get that done within about a day. Um, Catherine, do we have any, hold on, okay, we're, we've run out of time. I want to be respectful, even, even on my quick fire, I, I can only do so much. Um, so Jessica, if you want to, if you want to. Yeah, no, I mean, thank you, Joe. You did do an amazing job handling <laughs> that lightning round. Sorry, Catherine, we weren't able to get to the final question. Um, but, uh, you know, you've got Mike wanting to email you money because the OA DOI bulk checker works so well. My, my colleague Jennifer loves it and uh, thanks you gratefully for that as well. Um, 
I believe, Joe, if people do have questions, is there a place you would direct them to go or follow up? Uh, me, I go to places <laughs> any. Um, Joe at oa.works uh, is, is me, but I'm sure also it will get circulated um, afterwards. Um, and someone asked if they can email, email us money, which is, which is fine, go, go ahead, we love that. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Well, thank, thank you so you, much, wanna, everyone. Thank you so much. I um, I told you hit a lot of Canada by doing this presentation. So thank you. Um, we have Joe's contact if you'd like to follow up. I put a link in the chat to the upcoming repository call. It is on February eighth. I made a goof. Um, but a big thank you again to to Joe and to everyone who attended today and asked your questions. And um, yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs>